It's great to welcome Yaron Brook to the program today. Yaron is the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute and host of the Yaron Brook Show. This is the first in a series of discussions that we're producing in partnership with the Ayn Rand Institute. We're going to be talking eventually about capitalism, about welfare programs, about uh, maybe universal basic income and more. Today, we are going to start by talking about Ayn Rand herself and her ideas. Uh, Yaron, so great to have you on. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, uh, David. So in in my audience, I don't think it will come as a shock uh, to my audience to hear that my sort of worldview overall is not particularly in line with objectivism and Ayn Rand's ideas as I understand them. But it's possible, of course, that I that I misunderstand them to some degree. So just to like get started from your perspective, how do you if someone says I've never heard of Ayn Rand, I don't know what objectivism is. What's the entry point to starting a conversation about that? Well, first, I would note uh, she was a very successful author. Uh, she uh, a Russian, a Russian immigrant, somebody who came to this country very young with nothing. She started out literally with nothing, came to Hollywood uh, to, to try to get a job and, and worked in the back lot as, a, as an extra, started as an extra, worked in the wardrobe department, learned English uh, in order to be able to write, write scripts for Hollywood and ultimately write novels and became you know, one of the most successful American authors uh, ever. I mean, uh, whether you agree with her or not, uh, Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged have sold millions and millions of copies. And given given the, the, the thickness of the book, uh, it, it's a pretty amazing story. They, they sell probably more today than they did when she was alive. So uh, she was a very, very successful author. And, uh, you know, she developed a philosophy to a large extent in order to serve her literature. Uh, the philosophy was there in order to help her define and describe what she called the ideal man, the ideal man or woman, the, the ideal human being. And uh, her philosophy is, she called it a philosophy for living on Earth, for living life here, now, on this planet. Uh, and it was really trying to project or did project a heroic view of man. So she had a very heroic view of what we as individuals are capable of. So that would be an introduction. And then, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to go kind of into an overview of what her philosophy really stands for. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I having having read uh, it's been a while, but I read The Fountainhead. It, I read a lot and a lot of, of literature. It was not my cup of tea politics aside, but we are not here to adjudicate uh, uh, literary uh, uh, critique here. But sure. but uh, I, I think that your point about the philosophy serves the writing is an interesting one, because uh, I think I'll, you would probably agree much of the popularization of the fiction writing today is from groups that are actually really more into the the political philosophy of Ayn Rand than the fiction. And and in that sense, it's maybe a good entry point into what the philosophy is. Yes, I think most people most people are using the literature in order to get somewhere, but that was not her goal. Her goal was not, particularly when she was young, was not, I want to change the world or I want to present a particular philosophy of the world, therefore I'll write literature. Right. She, from a very young age, wanted to write literature. And then she came to a point where she wanted to project a particular type of human being, how it, uh, you know, how it work in, uh, in the fountainhead. And she said, well, what is the what is the views out there in the world of what this kind of human being looks like? What is an ideal man based on the philosophies that are acceptable in society? And she looked out there and she studied and she she read a lot of philosophy. And she said, none of these are me. None of these are what I want to present. None of them are what I sense is is the ideal man. I, I therefore I need to do some thinking, some studying and to develop a, a, a philosophical view of what that looks like. Um, so her, so she develops a philosophy again in service of the literature. So uh, if we start with the metaphysics, uh, Ayn Rand really, Ayn Rand views the world as reality is what it is. It's not what me or you feel like it should be. It's not why so, what some other consciousness, God or some other mystical element, thinks it should be. It is what it is. Uh, to, to quote Aristotle, A is A. It's unmutable. And then how do we know reality? Well, here again, 
we know reality through our reason, through our senses. Our senses are valid. Our senses actually give us information about reality as it is. And it is our reason that gives us information about reality. So emotions are not tools of cognition. And neither is revelation. There is no such thing as mystical revelation. Truth needs to be ascertained through reason and reason alone. And here I think maybe, you know, your audience might, uh, you know, at this point at least, up to this point, think, okay, uh, to the extent that they're secular, they might think that, that this is something that they, they agree with. And I think this is a good foundation on which we can build maybe whatever, whatever agreement there might be. But then the question is who reasons, right? And the fact is that only individuals can reason. Just like we, we don't have a collective stomach and we can't eat for each other. We don't have a collective brain. There's no such thing as a collective consciousness. There's no floating consciousness above us all that reasons, that discovers the truth. Only individuals can use their reason to discover the truth for themselves. And in morality, it's only our individual life that is the, the starting point for any kind of, for any kind of um, meaning. So it's our individual life that we must uh, attain. So her morality is based on the idea that our focus in morality should be on our own survival and that our moral purpose in life is our own individual happiness. So it's not a morality of we should sacrifice. It's not a morality. It's a, it's a morality that rejects the idea that your life is in service to the group, service to other people, or service to a god. Your life, the purpose of your life, is in service of your own survival, and the purpose of it all is your own happiness. But it also rejects the idea that we should ask other people to sacrifice for us. That is, it rejects the idea of exploiting other people, of using other people, in order to achieve our happiness. Our happiness is our responsibility and we must earn it. So let's, let's, I mean, that's a lot there. So let's start digging so, into where if we go a little further, we might start to get to some points of disagreement. So the idea of, you know, uh, uh, um, a reality independent of consciousness, so to speak, yes, that is not uh, unique to objectivism. So while it will likely sound relatively inoffensive, to many in my audience and even something that they generally would would agree with. Uh, it's important, I think, to understand that it is not unique to objectivism. And when we talk about something like uh, reason, as an example, uh, the idea of reason, I think, is very appealing to, to the vast majority of my audience. The issue, I think, for some in my audience and for me is yep. that when you look at the epistemology, of objectivism, you start getting into things like to pick an example, existence is identity, which for me at least starts to border a little bit on the Deepak Chopra type of stuff, you know, cosmic consciousness and all of these things that they sort of sound like they make sense. But at the same time, does this really mean anything objectively? So Ayn Rand actually never says existence is identity. Uh, you're, you're conflating two different things that she says. OK, she says existence exists. Uh, it, it, it just exists independent of consciousness. And then she says, things are what they are. A is A. You, a cannot be B. It cannot be its contradiction. Things are just all what they are. So yes, there's a sense in which this is not original. There's, there's very much a sense where this is uh, Aristotle. Uh, and and uh, she, she, she thinks of basically three fundamental coaxiomatic ideas at the core of metaphysics, and that is the ex existence exists, the law of identity, the Aristotelian law of identity of A is A, and the law of causality, things act based on their own nature. I don't think that's very controversial to uh, secular, you know, secular philosophers, certainly to philosophers who believe in reality, which is not everybody. There, there are a bunch of philosophers out there who don't think reality is a is a stable thing, and they don't. They even if they believe it's independent of consciousness, they don't believe it's it. It they they believe in contradictions. Hegel would be an example that that things are, you know, there are contradictions in reality in and of itself. Uh, so so while I think she he or she is very much Aristotelian, uh, I do think the way she puts it all together is uniquely hers. But I don't think this is where you get into controversy. I I do think there's some issues in epistemology. 
which could and and are more controversial and 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 where there is more probably more conflict between her and other philosophers and and where I think she's more original. Now, we're not going to get very deep into this because, among other things, it's not my area of expertise. But, you know, for example, Immanuel Kant has a very different view of human reason. Human reason, to a large extent for Kant, is detached from what we'll call real reality, right? It's, it, human reason, in a sense, creates its own reality because it is a, it is, there's a filter between the real world out there that we never know, that we never will know, and what our conception of the world is, and that reason is more played inside your own mind. And at the end of the day, he leads us towards a philosophy of the primacy of consciousness, where consciousness is primary, not reality. Uh, his view of reason detaches us from actual reality, from actual facts, from, from, from truth, in, in my view. And I think that's why Rand viewed Kant as, as, as the most damaging of all philosophers out there in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the Enlightenment's movement towards a proper understanding of reason, Immanuel Kant kind of throws a wrench into it and, and blows us into a completely different direction. I think for sure, one of the most controversial general areas is the way in which this worldview would dictate politics be done today, which is in a sense very relevant to many in the audience who say, well, hold on, if I adopt a Randian worldview, what does that mean about how government should function, et cetera? But before we get to that, the, yeah, the one thing I, before yeah, we get long before we get to that, yes, <laughs> um, the one thing I did want to mention is there is there a sort of existentialism ist idea that goes through some of this. Uh, and specifically what I mean by that is the idea from existentialism that what is important that it is an achievement merely to live one's life and to sort of be that that is in and of itself something to consider an achievement. Am I wrong to feel that there is some something about that through Ayn Rand's philosophy? It is, but but she is very different than the existentialist in this. Absolutely. Sense. So, yes. so there is a and, and you know, before we get to, to, to politics, I think her probably where there's real controversy, I think, with, with the audience and probably with you is in her ethics. And, and I think that's where we should spend some time. But this is related. So for the existentialist, there's this, the achievement is just to survive. And it doesn't matter so much how you survive. And indeed, happiness is really fleeting and almost an impossibility for them. For Rand, survival is an achievement. But it's not just any survival. It's not survival at the material level. It's survival, what she considers survival qua human being, survival as a full functioning human being, as a, as a fully manifest human being. So it's survival to your fullest potential. That's what to her is the moral ideal. It's to thrive in every dimension of our lives. It's to make the most of the life that we have. And Again, in, in, in opposition, if you will, to the existentialists who are very driven by emotional considerations and, and, and by, you know, or even uh, to differentiate her from Nietzsche, where there is this power of will, which again is emotion. Rand believes that the way to achieve success in living as a human being is to commit oneself to reason, to commit oneself to rationality, to commit myself to facts, to be you know, uh, excruciatingly honest about everything and committed to, to, to the facts of reality and everything one does and to focus one's lives on living the best life one can for oneself, but guided by reason, not by emotion, not by something called the will, but by guided by one's own reason and one's own one's understanding of what is true and of the facts of reality. Yeah, I mean, I think where we where we start to run into a problem and I've had these discussions before with people who s subscribe to any ideology, it doesn't matter what it is, is that when you lay out the principles in the abstract, the way you and I are doing right now, it seems much more tidy and neat than when you actually have to solve problems in the real world. And when the principles that one would espouse for themselves come into conflict with someone else attempting to live those same principles. And it seems like that is where the real hard work is. And if we want to use this to lead into the ethics, that's fine or we can stay here. But the principles are a great starting point. But I feel like they're only 20 percent of the conversation and the 80 percent, I believe, 
is done in figuring out how this applies in the real world? No, no, no doubt. I mean, everybody has to first understand the principles and accept them or not accept them, but first you have to understand them. And then one has to apply them. And, and application is not easy. It's, it's not trivial. I think, you know, it's, it's about living and it's about living consistent with those principles. And what does it mean, therefore, to live one's life for oneself guided by reason? Well, for Rand, it means certain virtues. It means committing oneself to certain virtues. It, it's committing oneself to one's mind, committing oneself to rational, rationally thinking through, not acting on emotions. And a lot of that is not, it's not only in conflict with other people. I mean, we, we, we have plenty of situations in life where our mind tells us to do one thing and our emotions are guiding us in a different direction. And we need guidance in order to decide, should I follow my emotion or should I follow my reason? And it's not obvious. So, you know, the Deepak Chopras of the world will often tell you, follow your emotion, you know, follow your so-called intuition. And Rand says, no, in any decision, you must use your mind. You must think it through. You must follow the facts and, and, and reason. So it's not just with other people, but certainly when it comes to other people, there's a question of justice, which then is an application of this morality. How, do you, how should you treat other people? And Rand would argue you should treat them in justice. And what does that mean? You should treat them based on how they deserve to be treated. And in different contexts in one life, desert means different things. Uh, so already there are certain moral codes that would say you should treat people the same. That, you know, the justice requires equality and Rand rejects that. Rand views justice as an issue of desert. And we could go over every one of her uh, virtues. She has seven, uh, which she articulates. Every one of those virtues and each one of those applies reason and rationality to a certain aspect of one's life with the goal being living the best life that you can, with a goal being your own individual happiness. Yeah, I mean, I guess to, to put in the most straightforward way, the way in which this creates an obvious conflict is that person A living their best life may require or at least it may be most readily achieved via actions that prevent person B from living their best life as just equally and, and, and definitively defined by Randy and philosophy. And how does how do we account for that? So Rand has a whole essay on this and, and it, you know, she has an essay uh, uh, which asks the question, answers the question, is there a conflict between rational men, a, a rational man in constant conflict, are there values in constant conflict? And her view is no, that there is no conflict there. And you would have to come up with, with particular, um, you know, particular scenarios in order to, to kind of untangle all that. But she could argue that my seeking my values does not conflict with you seeking your own values in the big scheme of things. Now, in the moment, it might appear for that to be that. So, for example, only one of us can get the job, right? <laughs> There's a job. We're both we're both uh, we're both applying for it. We're both rational. We're both being honest. We're both uh, qualified. But only one of us is going to get the job. And she would argue that a rational person would not want a job. If somebody else was more qualified for him, for whatever reason, than he was, he would not want the job uh, if he was getting some special favor or if he was being viewed as, yeah, you're less qualified, but we'll take you. That is, it's not a value to that person to get a job under those circumstances. And therefore, it is consistent with his own values, sometimes not to get a job. So it might be hard. It might in the moment be unpleasant. But in the scope of one's life, it is not a contradiction. I don't know. I mean, this this starts to get edging into uh, there's an interesting clip. Um, it's not a perfect analogy, but there's a very interesting discussion that took place between uh, Jordan Peterson and a guy named Matt Dillahunty. And in a discussion about morality absent uh, religious doctrine, Jordan Peterson asserted that even those who believe that they are atheists, if they are moral, deep down, they actually are religious. They may just not even know it. And when you say that 
even if in the short term it appears as though this is a, a, a violation of the values because they wanted the job, even if they were less qualified, that in the long run, it is more consistent with one's values not to get the job, even if it means your family starves, even if it means oh, all sorts. I mean, you know, it starts to you, get a you, you know, borderline borderline conditions are always tricky and kind of like both scenarios. I don't believe a part of morality. Most of us who apply for jobs are not in the situation where your family starves. It's one job out of many. Uh, but I, but I think I think it's absolutely real. I, I, I think that, it, you know, lots of people get jobs which where they are not qualified for and they feel terrible once they discover that they're not qualified for and the long term negative consequences on their lives are not good. And they'd be better off if they didn't get the job uh, in the long run. Uh, they, there are a lot of you, you can you can imagine. And, and I think that it's, it's self-evident that there are a lot of situations where we want something. But actually not getting that something at that moment in time is actually better for us. Now, sure. we might not realize it at the time. We're all going to be disappointed. We're all going to be sad sometimes. Life is not one long, you know, you know, chewy, happy, uh, un unquestioning, uh, you know, pleasure, pleasurable thing. There are ups and downs and there are challenges. But the point is that if one lives consistently according to these ideas, one does achieve a state of happiness. One does achieve success. And when one reviews one's life, when you look at these situations, I think if you approach it rationally, you don't feel like, oh, there's this, I hate this other guy because he got the job and I didn't. I, you know, if, if I think that the decision was made rationally, then he got the job and I didn't. And I don't know. I, I think that, I think that it's a bit dismissive of the reality that you know, in the scenario where the two people vying for the job are middle class people who, if they don't get this job, they'll find some other job. I think it is very sort of uh, um, uh, establishment centric in the sense that there are hundreds of millions or even billions of people on this planet for whom it really might be the opportunity that exists to feed their family and to avoid absolutely horrible conditions. And the idea of saying, listen, in the long run, just adhering to the values is going to be better for everybody. For, for a lot of people, it's not it, getting the job, even if you're unqualified, is actually going to be better objectively. <laughs> yes and no. I, but look, um, I'm assuming here that people are rational. I'm assuming people here are living and thinking long term. And yes, there are situations in life where you you grab what you can get certainly in the countries in the world right now where people are starving where i don't expect them to have this kind of attitude and and they are living a lifeboat scenario they are living survival you know get the job or die and then you grab the job i'm, I'm not going to judge somebody like that in in that kind of scenario i'm just saying that and and i don't consider this middle class because i consider i consider this true in in any free economy that this is true of of anybody in whatever their social economic status is, uh, that in a free economy, if you know, you're never on the verge of starvation. An advanced free economy, you're never on the verge of starvation. Options exist, and and maybe this now spills into economics and spills into politics. But you've got to take over if you want to have a healthy, successful life. If you're gonna be happy long term, you're going to have to take that long term perspective. And again, that long term perspective might be painful in the short run, but it'll pay off, uh, pay off multiple times in the long run. And this is not just look, uh, I'm trying to think of a of a of a of a scenario, but you know, you well, even without a specific one. I mean, I think this is an example of why some people hear this oh. and they say, wow, that sounds extraordinarily dismissive of a lot of people's situations. It sounds like and this is I don't know if you would agree that Randy and philosophy feeds into applied to modern politics, a sort of libertarian ideology. I but don't like the word libertarian, but free market ideology certainly it sure. certainly it firstly feeds into free markets. And look, let's let's take let's take a political issue for for, for the hell of it. Yeah. Uh, and let's take something like uh, affirmative action, right? So a certain percentage of people get a jobs, not because they qualified, but because of the color of their skin, which I find offensive. And well, I hold on a second. I think that that we need we, we can't go further until we're, we don't necessarily agree about what that if you have 
Well, two, you, you, hold on a second, though. But like you've identified people can be equally qualified. You could have equally qualified people where deference is given to a group that has been historically oppressed. So that's hypothetically possible. Let's make an assumption. I'm okay. not saying this is true always. Okay. It certainly is not true always. Sometimes the person with a different color of the skin is better. <laughs> and sometimes they're the same. But let's say there are circumstances, and I believe there are circumstances, and I think the empirical evidence suggests once in a while, Somebody gets in for a job they're not fully qualified for. There were more p people who were more qualified for, and they get the job in spite of that. Yeah, right? I would argue the primary reason for that is nepotism, not affirmative action, but fair, whatever the reason may be. Maybe, but there's certainly are cases where it's affirmative action. Uh, and, and, and you can just look at the admission standards at Harvard to see that in action. But uh, what does that say? to them, put aside the political issue. Let's talk just about the person. What does that reflect about in terms of their own self-esteem and in terms of the pride that they have in getting that job? Well, first, it, they don't know why they got the job and there's a, there's a probability, it might be very low, you know, maybe I'll accept what you say and it's very low, but there might be a probability that they didn't get the job because of their qualification. Maybe it's because of nepotism, maybe it's affirmative action, maybe it's a thousand different other things, but it affects their self-esteem. Okay. They don't know why they got the job. It reduces the ability to have pride in what they achieve in that job. When they fail in that job, if they fail, or in the school, if they fail, um, that is crushing to them, right? Uh, so. I think it has real world application and, and, and I'm against nepotism. I'm against people getting what they don't deserve, what they don't deserve on their merits. And when people do get it, it has a psychological self-esteem uh, price to pay. And I would rather live in a world in which we minimize that. You, you're never going to minimize, uh, you know, uh, nepotism completely, but I would like to minimize it as much as possible. And I think the only way to minimize it is to, for both parties, all parties, to adopt a rational approach to hiring, for example, or to any activity in life. And look, we don't live in a rational world. We don't live in which people are, for the most part, rational. And put aside the politics, put aside the, the, the particular politics, even in, in personal ethics. People are not rational, people are not honest, people are deceiving themselves and lying to themselves all the time. And people are committing uh, I, I following emotions and, and following lots of things that I think are wrong. So it doesn't surprise me that people are upset by lots of stuff that happens to them all around them. And the fact that I know that the higher the people who are hiring might not be basing the hiring on the most rational merit based assessment that they might be nepotism, let's say, or other standards going into it, would cause me to be frustrated if I don't get a job. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, I th we're not going to now adjudicate affirmative action in total because we've got so many other things to talk about. But I think this is sort of like when the focus around the climate becomes, should the government force you to use a particular type of straw? I argue that's the wrong conversation. When 100 companies do 70 percent of the pollution, me changing the type of straw I use, I think, is a red herring in the same way when you look at something like college admissions at the at the really elite schools and you look at the number of people that are either legacy admissions related to someone who's made a big donation and you compare it to sure. cases in which what you've got equally qualified people where deference was given to someone from an underprivileged group. I focus on the bulk of the problem myself, but that's probably a not well, my, the conversation. I mean, again, my focus is completely different. Yes. You know, I, I, I would love for Harvard to be a truly private institution that does not get a dime from the government and as a consequence makes its own admissions decisions and if it wants to discriminate in any way it has the right to discriminate so what i want is for the government what i ideally want with all these issues is for the government to get out of the way and private citizens to, to engage in it and and maybe later we'll get to the pollution question and what counts as pollution and what doesn't uh and 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 how you deal with real pollution issues but but you know i i think that once we once we acknowledge that once we let private individuals do what they want to do, rather than have to abide by some government regulation or some government standard, they, that then you have to adjudicate by who should be discriminated against who? Is it Asians? Is it whites? Is it and, and then we we get into a conversation that's all racist because we're judging people by their race one way or the other, whether it's uh, whether it's the way we treat Asians or the way we treat whites or the way we treat blacks or anybody else. 
Uh, I think that's a losing proposition to begin with. We, you know, we, they, and, and, and this is, this is a, a really bad place to be and it's a bad place the country is in. But going back to personal morality, yeah. the key here is for people to take their life seriously. And look, there's nothing in this philosophy that is middle class or elitist in any way. I truly believe that these are the set of ideas, these are the set of virtues that apply to anybody, anybody starting out in any position in life. If they want to have a good life, and a good life is not measured in money, you know, so it's not about money. It's not, a, it's not just about money. Money's a factor, but it's not just about money. That's another, I mean, people always think of Ayn Rand in materialistic terms, but it's not just about money. It's about the kind of life you live. And to live a good life, a life of pride and self-esteem, a life that you can be proud of having lived, requires, you know, following certain principles. And it's not always easy to follow those principles. The decisions don't always uh, going to make you uh, happy. I, I give you, I'll give you an example uh, from The Fountainhead, which, which you said you have read. I, I don't know if you remember the scene or not, but there's a scene in The Fountainhead. Howard Rourke is the struggling architect. And there's a scene in The Fountainhead where this bank is going to hire him to build a building. And they're going to pay him a lot of money. But they just want to make few changes to his design. And a few changes to his design completely destroy the integrity of the building, the integrity of the design. And he says no. And he walks away and he lands up working in a quarry in order to feed himself. Because, yeah, sometimes your decisions are very tough. Now, is he better off for making that decision long term, not taking the money and going to work in the quarry? Ayn Rand's point is yes. Your personal integrity, living by those ideas, and sticking to that integrity and living a complete life without compromise, sometimes it's going to require you to go work in a quarry. Sometimes it's going to require you to somehow lose a lot of money and struggle. But if you follow through on it, you will be successful in living, whether it comes in dollar signs or not you will be successful in life. And that is why they call it a fictional novel. <laughs> but, it, but, but, no, but, but, but 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 you, you, you see people who do that. It I happens. Mean, but the opposite happens as well as the reality. I mean, there, there are many cases. The opposite. The, the, the opposite the, would be I compromise on the building. I compromise on my value and I still no, live a happy life. The opposite would be so, the opposite would be in the short term. In the short term, you compromise that compromise allows you in the long term to take the fruits of that compromise and change the system. That is what the problem is. I mean, listen, this is like let, I'll give you an example and then maybe this will be a good we're getting into the politics, so it may be a good place to pause. I often have to make decisions about listen, um, air travel. Would you grant that air travel does pollute the planet? We can disagree about what the solution would be or, or how much, but planes flying around this, this releases emissions into the atmosphere. Would you, would you grant that you're on? I grant that it releases emissions into that. Very good. One could argue I should stop all air travel to places where I am going to speak about what I do. Uh, but I could also say, listen, the cost that I am exhibiting by releasing this is smaller than the number of people I might inspire who in the next 50 years will go and make positive changes. That that is how I might compromise my value in the short term. But in the long term, I actually am doing a better thing. Well, I mean, uh, you know, if you really accept what you believe and, and if, let's let's say we'll accept a, a, an extreme version of that where the world is literally, you know, it's it's in the next 12 years. If we don't stop flying in the next 12, the world, the world is going to end. Then I'm not sure that's a good compromise. Uh, I don't buy into that. I'm not sure you do. But um, but yes, one has to one has to have a hierarchy of values and figure out how to ascertain how to gain uh, our, our most important values. Um, and sometimes one has to give up a, a lower value in order to attain a higher value. And that's, you know, what Ayn Rand is arguing is for creating a hierarchy of value, defining a hierarchy of value, and making sure you never give up high value, your integrity as an artist, okay. or a low value. That would be a sacrifice. But giving up a, a lower value for the sake of a higher value, well, of course, you do that every day. Every minute that you live is a minute you can do 55 different things. And you choose to do one, and in a sense, you're giving up doing the 54 other things, but you're not. So the, the, the idea here is, is to have principles 
by which one defines one's values, one creates a hierarchy of value, and then one makes sure that you're never sacrificing something higher for something lower. Okay. And live one's life consistently based on that. All right. Well, we've now expanded to just beyond the initial definition, which was just about any compromise, to the idea of a, of a hierarchy, which I think is a more uh, well developed well, idea. Sure. I mean, I, I, you know, this is a very short period of time, but we're talking about, you know, when I said compromise, I mean, a moral compromise. Obviously, if my wife wants to go to movies and I want to go to, to a restaurant and we com and I compromise and go to movies with her, that's not a moral compromise that we're going to, you know, that, that I believe you should never do. So it's it's a question of how important is something to you. Absolutely. In that hierarchy and one should never give up what's really, really important for something less important. So let's pause the conversation there. In part two, we're, we're really getting into economics and politics. And in part two, we're going to be dealing with capitalism specifically. Uh, sure. We've been speaking with Yaron Brook, who is chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute and host of the Yaron Brook show. And uh, we will have our next conversation with Yaron coming up very soon.